And uh, here's the agenda. You know, like all meetings, we should have agenda. Uh, we're gonna go like why you want to use containers, what are containers, a little bit of history of what containers were, like you know, how they were evolved over the years. Um, what is Docker? Uh, orchestration. By orchestration, I mean container orchestration. And we're going to talk a little bit about Docker Swarm and then a little bit of demo. You guys still wait. So, let's talk about why containers, right? So, before we like start answering this question, right, why do you want to use containers? Uh, let's talk a little bit about like what the problem we are facing right now for modern uh, software systems face when it comes to distributing all those all the applications across different physical servers, right? So this is a very typical, uh, you know, hardware that most systems run now. Right? Uh, there's, it's called the, uh, this is what virtualization is, right? So there are two types of virtualization, type one and type two. So there's a type one hypervisor, which actually, like it's a software which sits on top of hardware, and then it lets you uh, provision uh, guest OSs, right? So different operating systems on top of one general server, right? Uh, there's a type two hypervisor, which is actually which is installed on a hardware which already has an OS on it. Right? And then it actually creates more operating system. Right? So there are many advantages of doing that, right? This actually reduces our pure cost of uh, provisioning servers, right? Because now you're using those hardware resources efficiently, right? Uh, what hypervisors do is like prevent the host OS, you know, so this, these OS are like host OSs. It presents them the complete set of like CPU and memory and other other blocks of like compute that it needs, right? So you're using your hardware very efficiently. So this is what this is how most applications get uh, deployed, right? Uh, now let's talk about the applications that gets deployed into these systems, right? So modern software systems are very complex, right? This is actually a construct from platform diagram, right? It's pretty complex. Uh, there are so many components in it, right? You have multiple databases, you have so many uh, services, web apps, there are lots of uh, analy analytics databases, there are lots of queues, uh, lots of logging software, right? So it's a very complex system. On top of that, we have many languages that we use, right? So the complexity increases, right? So you have this complex uh, architecture. You have lots of operating systems that you want to use uh, depending on what component you're talking about, right? And obviously, all the complex algorithms that you want to you know, come up with on all the systems, right? So, that is just the software system. Now, we need to deploy this into various environments. That could be your own laptop, right? Developer's laptop. Your coworker's laptop means you're using a Windows laptop. You have the build server, right? Then you have the QA environment, you have the staging environment, you have the production environment, and obviously the cloud, right? So, so you have these complex systems which you want to deploy multiple targets that presents a problem. And that problem is what is called this metrics from hell, right? Because you have all these systems, you want to deploy into different uh, types of uh, infrastructure. So how do you make sure that all the dependencies that the application needs are available on every of these, all of these targets, right? It's very complex. Right? So before we talk into like what, how do you solve this, let's look at a similar problem from the physical world, right? And that is the shipping industry. They also have a metric of that. So before like 1950s and 60s, <coughs> in the exact days, right? If you wanted to ship goods, you know, there was no standard way. So how do you like, you know, take the goods out of the factory, put it on the truck, and then like put it on trains and ships and everything, so right? it was very difficult. So how do you make sure that, you know, the coffee and your spices don't mix together, right? How do you make sure the acids that you're shipping don't mix with your furniture? Right? It was very difficult. So the solution that they came up with was container. Shipping container like revolutionize the way we get shipping. Obviously, uh, you can like give all the credit to globalization for to these containers, right? They literally make it very easy for us to ship goods, right? 
uh, it reduces a lot of uh, time that people used to spend on the docks. You can simply just take the container, like put it on a train, on a truck, wherever it's very standard, it's stackable. Uh, so it reduces a lot of uh, time people spending on the docks, reduces a lot of cost. But the shipping became very efficient. Right? So back to our problem. We can do something similar using Linux containers. So that is what why we need containers. It makes very easy to ship all our software across all those multiple targets, right? So now let's talk about what are containers. Right? When you talk about Linux containers, what actually it is, right? So this is a rough definition from Linux Computers Foundation, right? So containers are basically an isolated environment, which is as close as possible to a virtual machine. We'll talk more into that later. But it does not have the overhead of running a separate kernel right, for every operating system. If you look in the virtualization world, all your gas stores is running the full kernel. Right? Containers don't need to do that. So here's a look at the comparison between what is the difference between virtualization and containerization. Right? So as I said earlier, the hypervisor that you know, virtualizes your hardware, right? It provides a complete set of hardware, the CPU, the disk, and everything to the guest operating system. And it fools that system to believe that I'm running on a real hardware. But it's actually all virtual, right? Uh, containers, and containers on the other hand, the containerization on the other hand, uh, it does not need to provision a new kernel. Right? It's, it's running on the same kernel. It's only, uh, it's, it's only, like virtualizing the things that that particular process needs. It does not need everything, right? It does not need a full kernel. It will only virtualize some of the things that that application binary needs. So that's what containers do for you. But one of the main uh, requirement for containerization to work is that your host OS, on top of which you run your containers, it has to be the same kernel version. Right? In virtualization, the hypervisor does not care what those guest OSs are. There could be multiple versions of your kernel. But in containerization, you need to make sure that you're running on a Linux, same version of a Linux kernel. Right? So I know when everybody talks about containers, they think about Docker. Right? But Docker did not invent containers. They have been here for a long, long time. This is just a very rough history of what has been done on the Linux side of when you want to talk about containers. Uh, starting with CH root, so I'm sure Linux and users know what CH root is. It actually uh, provides an arbitrary directory to a group of processes, right? Thinking that that is my root directory. So that was the level of very, the way some level of isolation that the kernel provided for a group of processes to run within the directory structure. Okay. There are other implementations like jails and then uh, the Linux virtual server, Solaris containers. There are lots of different implementations. But the real work started around 2006 when they, when they included process containers, right? which then quickly got renamed to control groups because of a lot of naming convention and a lot of fights that happened. You can go you know, read about all that. Right? Uh, so these control groups is when you know, people really started taking containers very seriously. So what are control groups? So control groups limits and allocates resource usage to a collection of processes, right? So you have all the resources available to a kernel, right? And any process that runs on your kernel, whether it's a Java process or whatever process it is, right? It has access to all the resources that the system has. Right? But C groups actually limits what amount of those resources you can give, you can give to that process or a group of process or the children of those processes. So now we can run processes in real isolation. Software control groups, it was LXC, which is literally means Linux containers. And Linux containers builds on top of all those things that have been worked on in the kernel for over the years. Like, so it builds on top of control groups, like team spaces and other like security features that the kernel provides. Right? And Linux containers, what they did was they provided an API, a simple API which you can use from your programs you know, to create containers. You create them, you manage them, right? 
So Linux containers already have the API. Then there are like much more different implementations. Uh, this LMCD file literally means let me containerize that for you. <laughs> then uh, Docker, of course, has actually completely changed the way we use containers because they made it very, very simple and no longer more in, in that do that. Uh, the other containers are also the Rocket, what is called the Rocket Containers, RKT. Uh, it stemmed from uh, the project that was going on in Google for many, many years now. So Google has been using containers in their own systems for decades. Right? So the Rocket Container Engine was something that Google started developing. So out of all these containers, and the, our, our, these are all the containers, but there are all these things that led to containers. But what we are more interested in is Galaxy. Right? Linux containers. So this is what LXC does. Right? It uses those built-in Linux features you know, to create a management interface, which then you can use to create containers. Right? So you can you can define LXC as a as a user space interface, you know, which then you can use to all use all those Linux containment features. It's somewhere. It's between like a CH root that you just saw and an actual physical, uh, an actual virtual machine, right? It's somewhere between that. And I use some of the, uh, some of the very useful uh, Linux features like namespaces, C groups, and S units, and we go more into that. So what are namespaces, right? So you know just the CH root allows processes to see an arbitrary directory. What namespaces allow is actually, uh, it, it actually allows the whole process tree to get, uh, just not the directory, but it will virtualize the, all the, uh, the CPU, the networking stack, and everything that the kernel provides. It will, it will isolate a group of processes so that it can only use certain resources. Uh, that's how you can like, segregate some of the processes, but they, they don't like, uh, interfere with other processes. C groups like we talked about. SC Linux is uh, it's another implementation which actually provides security. It, and by security, I mean it, it will restrict a process to use resources which is used by other processes. And all of this is very important like when you talk about containers because you don't want. Is it the C group which limits the resources or is it the namespace? The C group that limits the resources, but C groups and namespaces work in conjunction. Namespace is basically, it's all the process tree, you know, the process namespace. So namespace is like everything, all the resources in Linux are namespaces, right? There's, a, there's an IPC namespace, there's a memory namespace, there's a CPU sets, all those things are namespaces. By default, all those namespaces, every, every process has access to all those namespaces. But what, uh, what names, with other namespaces, what you can do, you can create namespaces per process. And that way you can contain those processes. And like, like I was talking, like SC Linux is something that it provides security features within uh, security so that processes cannot talk to each other. Right? It gives you a lot of, uh, because what, what happens like you don't need a lot of processes that the kernel creates when you create computers, right? You don't need certain processes that you want to, that you have no use for, right? So it will secure those processes which only want to use and won't let other processes interfere with your process. So let's talk a little bit about Docker, what Docker is, right? So like I mentioned earlier, Docker is is not something that it, they're not they're not the ones who created containers. So they build on top of all these features that we just talked about, right? Docker uses Linux container at the LXE interfaces build on top of that. But what it really does is it provides a very good portable format for you to describe your containers. And then it also has a very rich interface which developers can easily use to create containers. Right? So before it was very difficult for every developer to use containers. It was very limited to people who are working on the DevOps side. It was very good in-depth knowledge of the Linux kernel. Right? But with Docker, you don't need to know about all those things that we just talked about. You don't care what the C group is, what the namespace is, what are the Linux security policies you need to worry about, how do you manage resource allocation, all those things. You don't need to know about any of this. Docker simply abstracted all of that and created a very rich API. Right? So with this, 
Docker still creates containers. It uses the Linux the LXE interface to create containers for you. But now developers can then simply just write a specification and then doc, uh, the Docker engine is going to create a container for you. Uh, there are a lot of things that Docker solves, just like how what containers can solve. It's uh, mo most important thing is the dependencies, right? When you talk about application dependencies, there's going to be many different types of dependencies. There's cross-platform dependencies, right? So a platform has a certain dependency which is not available on the other platform that you want to run your application on, right? How do you solve that? There could be conflicting dependencies. You know, one application is using a different dependency, other application needs a different version of the dependency, but your system, the platform you use, has to have the dependency. So you, which version do you run on your system, right? So there's this conflict in dependencies. There could also be custom dependencies which you don't want to run on all your platforms. How do you solve the dependency problem? That's when containers in Docker in general which solve make it very easier. That you can describe all the dependencies that you need in an application in a simple format, which is called a Docker file, which we'll just take a look at. And you can then just build your entire application image out of the dependencies. Uh, one of the major differences when you talk about Linux containers and Docker is Docker also uses something called as the union file system. So that makes Docker containers very, very light. Okay. Every time you de de declare a dependencies in a Docker container, it creates layers of files on top of each other, right? So now, all of this, this makes the Linux containers very, very small. So now, with Docker containers, you can ship those containers very easily. Before, like, those Linux containers were very difficult to ship from one, one uh, platform to the other platform because they were both. Not as bulky as the VMs, but they were still bulky. It was not very easy to move those containers around. But with Docker containers, they're so small, you can build them in seconds. Uh, they're also like very manageable size that you can like move it over the network, like put it into some kind of registry, and then even put it down on some other system. So that's what Docker made it very easy to use. Containers. So let's talk a little bit about Docker architecture. Right? So the core of the Docker, the Docker software, is the Docker daemon process. And the Docker daemon process is something that run on any Docker host, and that Docker host has to be a Linux operating system. And the Docker daemon is the one which actually interacts with the, the kernel features that we have talked about, the LXC, the namespace, and all those, those things. And that daemon is the one that creates those containers for you, that manages, it, it creates all those namespaces, it makes sure that containers don't talk to each other and all the resources are well maintained. Right? That's what the daemon does. Right? Uh, the daemon also provides a very rich HTTP API so that you can interact with the daemon. You can tell the daemon what to do using those HTTP APIs. Then you have the Docker client, which you can install on the Docker host itself or you can install anywhere. And the client uses that HTTP API to talk to the daemon. And that's how you can interact with the daemon, whether you're logging in the same system where the daemon is running, or you're on your laptop and the daemon is somewhere else. And the other cool thing about Docker is that they come up with this thing called the registry. Right? This registry is a, is, it's a place where you keep all your Docker images, right? So if you're familiar with Linux and the Linux package manager, it's something very similar. Right? This Docker registry is where you store all your Docker images. So when you build a Docker image, which we'll take a look at, you can push that Docker image into this registry. So if you're doing it from your laptop, you can build an image and push it onto a registry, and then you can go to another platform and pull down the image and then run the container. That's how we run Docker containers at our server. Okay. okay, so how it actually works. The first thing over here is the Docker file. And as I mentioned earlier, Docker made it very simple to declare what your container is, right? And that container declaration uh, scheme, if you will, is, is this Docker file. What it's actually really doing is it's instructing the daemon that, oh, that you pull down this particular base image, right? In this case, it's an Alpine Linux uh, image. And then on top of that, you run all those Linux commands, right? So basically, you can put anything which is a Linux command, 
can be run on a Linux command, you can put that in a Docker file, right? So you declare all your application dependencies in terms of uh, Linux commands. In this case, we are just adding some more some directories into your images, and then we are uh, then we are providing a script, and that script is what is the entry point into your container. Uh, so now, how do we build an image out of this out of this uh, declaration of what our application should look like? Right? So when you run the Docker build command, right, it reads this Docker file. And then using that HTTP API, it sends the entire context of your Docker file. Right? So, so this Docker file lives with your application source. And then it sends everything that's in the directory to the daemon. Right? And the Docker daemon reads this Docker file, and then it starts creating layers of your application image. Right? But every instruction in the Docker file here is a layer. It's a different file system. It's a very thin file system on top of each other. Right? So if something changes, it, it can reuse the layer which it already created before. And what the demon, when it starts building this, uh, all these layers, it finally comes up with an image of your application, which is which is everything that your application needs, right? And then it, it creates, it uh, puts that image onto the same host of the Docker demon. Right? The next thing you can do with that is you can publish that image into the registry. It's a very simple command. You can do Docker publish. Now we'll take this image and put it into a registry. And then when you actually run the Docker run command, what it's actually doing is, when you say docker run, it's instructing the daemon on that particular docker host to pull down the image from the registry if it's not already there. And then it will execute this entry point that you specified in your docker file. And that entry point could be anything. Over here it's a cell script, but it could be a Java process, a Java command, or a Node.js command, or whatever you want to say. It could be even a bash script. The entry point could be anything that you can run on a Linux system. Any process you can execute on a Linux system. So this is very powerful. Now developers, they don't need to worry about like where am I going to run this? You know, will be the places I want to run this, do they have enough uh, resources, all the binaries, all my dependencies that it needs or not, right? You can simply define everything that your application needs right from the base operating system level, right? And then you can just build that container and ship it to the registry and let all the DevOps guys worry about how to run this. So this eliminates, you know, the question that everybody faces in their programming career, like, oh, it worked on my machine, it didn't work on the other machine, right? You can no longer say that, because if you internalize that, and if it worked on your machine, it should work on the, every, other, every other machine that the doctor even is running. So, in a nutshell, containers before Docker was something like this. It was very, very tough to use containers. Like you need to have very in-depth knowledge of all the Linux kernel features. Right? The learning curve was very, very high. What Docker simply did was actually we have used this picture to actually describe some of our stuff. Come on, picture. So what Docker now did was instead of this, we made it something like this. Just like click a button and then just and I'm checking to cross our comment. That's just not the yes. So now we have a way to run containers, right? But surely you're not going to run just one container of your application. You're going to run multiple containers. You're going to run your application stacking containers, right? You'll have containers talking to each other. Their entire application could be a group of containers which came up with different images. So how do you manage all that? Docker run, yes, Docker run is going to run one container, but then how do you run all of this in the production system? How do you deploy a container into, that's 100 servers spread across a whole, a, a big geographical area? Like how do you do that? You're not going to log into the system into that, right? And that's why you need something called container orchestration. So container orchestration is a tool, right? It's a software tool which should do all of those things for you. You should provision your container or a multi-container app onto this entire cluster of servers right, with a very declarative format. It should allow you to provide your entire application blueprint. Right? So not just a Docker file. Docker file can describe your image. But let's say if you have an application which has five containers and you want to run three containers of one 
image or a template of the other image, you know, link some of them together, you know, do, do some like file system mounting on some of them, and not on some, and you don't, don't want to do it on the other ones. So you describe all that. So this software tool, you can orchestration tool, should provide you some kind of a schema which you can describe what you want to do with your application and all its dependencies. It should also provide a lot of monitoring, right? What if one computer goes down, right? It should provide some policy management, which is very important. You can, you should be able to say, I want to run, at any given time, I want to run like 100 containers of this application. Now what if there was 10 containers running on one of the hosts and the host dies? So then now you only have 90 containers. How do you want to run, how do you make sure you have those, you're back to the 10 100 containers that you initially said that was my desired state, right? So orchestration tools should do all of that for you. It should provide you services, code, which is very important, right? Uh, if your containers, if your service is running as containers, and you need dependent, if you're dependency on some other RESTful service, how do you find that service? Right? It should be discoverable from within that cluster itself. Right? So that service discovery pattern should be built in. Now, the most important thing is it should integrate with the existing systems, like for example, your CI tools, like your other monitoring tools that you have. Right? It should integrate with all the systems. So that's what orchestration <coughs> should do for you. And there are lots of players in orchestration market, right? Uh, if you look at Kubernetes, it's another like Google project, uh, which is a real, which does, it was designed to just do container orchestration from the ground up. Uh, it supports Docker, but it also supports the rocket containers that we looked at a little bit earlier. There are lots of other systems like Apache Mesos and Microsoft Azure. They also provide a lot of uh, orchestration tools. Uh, Google Container Engine, Amazon its own ECS, it's called Elastic Container Service. And all of this, they do everything that we just talked about before and they do very, very good. Uh, but the one we're going to talk about is Docker Swarm. So what is a little bit different about Docker Swarm? So Docker Swarm is the, all the cluster management built in within that con Docker container engine. So the engine that we looked at in the architecture diagram earlier, right? It's not just like managing all your Docker containers, but like with the new version of Docker from version 1.12, that Docker engine also has cluster management built in. Right? And by default, it's not turned on, so that you can easily use all of that. Right? Some of the main advantages is like you don't need any additional software to run some of the cluster management and uh, orchestration uh, tasks that you need. Right? You already have the Docker engine. If, if Docker is a container engine of choice, then you already have Docker engine installed on all your systems. You don't need any additional software, any other orchestration tool to do those tasks for you. Docker can do it already. It's very, very easy to set up. Some of those orchestration tools is, it's a nightmare to set up. You know, you've got all the systems and then like uh, make sure all the binaries are included and it's, it's a nightmare to set up all the systems, right? But with Docker Swarm, it's very easy. Right? It's as easy as those two commands. You can go to number one system, say Docker Swarm in it, it's gonna start your Swarm cluster. You go to like 50 other clusters, 50 other servers, and say Docker Swarm join and give the IP of the one one server that you just started in you know, and then it's going to create a cluster of 50 servers. It's as simple as that. And you can easily script that to run the router here. Uh, but the most important thing is all those orchestration tasks that we talked about, those are all built in in Swarm. Right? You can do multi host networking. You know? So if you have hosts which are running across different data centers, when you talk about cloud, you can, you can have hosts which are running across different geographical areas, different availability zones. right? So, but with Docker Swarm, you can network across all those hosts, and all of this is built in. The service discovery built in. It also does like load balancing across all your containers. Like if you have 10 containers, and if you want to hit your service, it will load balance that request across those 10 containers, and that could be running anywhere. Right? It could be running at any driver for the page. You can still do that. Okay, so every, every Docker host in this Swarm cluster talk to each other in a, in a secure manner when you call this. TLS security is already uh, built in in the Swarm cluster. It's quite rolling updates. You know. uh, updating your application is as easy as just running an update command and giving a new image. But having said that, it's still not a real orchestration tool because it does not provide very good monitoring. There's very rudimentary health checks which are available, but it also does not provision those actual Docker servers Yes, it's going to start containers, missing containers on its own, 
but let's say if traffic increases, then it's not going to start your container on its own. There's no built-in techniques to do all that. But it is very, very useful, and this is what we'll be using on using later on the cars and the ones we move to cloud. So having said all of that, I'm going to try and do a little bit of demo. <laughs> so the part of this demo is that whatever I talked about, I talked about the ease of you know, deploying these containers in a cloud environment. So technically my demo should not take long. It should be very, very simple to do. Right? So let's try and do that. Okay, so uh, so I already have a swarm cluster running on Amazon. I use uh, Terraform to create this uh, Swarm cluster. And if you want to learn more about Terraform and how do you manage all this infrastructure, you should definitely get in Kyle's talk later in the day. He's going to go on all these tools you can use to create all this infrastructure on the cloud itself where you can run your application. So it's, and I highly encourage you guys to work with it. So I already have the Swarm cluster, right? I can just do this. So what I'm doing right now is I'm on my laptop, right? I'm, I'm running, I'm interacting with the Docker client on my laptop, but this client is talking to the daemon on one of the managers, one of the small managers on, his, on AWS, right? So when I type that command docker node ls, it actually sends an HTTP request to one of the uh, Docker swarm managers, and it gave me back whatever I needed to know. In this case, I needed to know what my nodes are. So I have three leaders, so I have three managers, and then I have like these four worker nodes, which are out there. And now I can give them something to run. Uh, so let me try and do this. So I already have an application. This is a clutch application. I'm not going to bore you guys again with creating a clutch app. I'm sure many of you guys have already seen that multiple times. Uh, but let me see what so let's do this. Are you expecting one of them to be down like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Alright, so just to talk a little bit, when I did Docker node LS into this shell, so these are my different shells, right? This one already was configured to talk to the AWS Docker demons. This one was talking to my local Docker, which is running using Docker for Mac. Uh, to look at the difference, when I did go node LS over here, it showed me the list of all the servers which I had on AWS. Okay? This one, when I did that, it actually showed me just my laptop, right? which is running laptop, right? the Docker server running on the laptop. So the cool thing about this is when I export this Docker host variable in the shell, and I give it the IP address and uh, a port to listen on, it's going to talk, when I type the command again, it should give me, it should talk to the daemon in AWS. Right? Can you guys read this? No. There. Now I'm on. Oh, now my this demon, my client is connecting to the demon on the device, right? Uh, so a little bit about this application is a clutch application, right? Uh, it is obviously authorized, right? And then we use Powertrain to deploy stuff. Now, if you're been, if you're familiar with Powertrain that we use over here at Cars, it actually helps us uh, start containers and uh, stop containers on all our hosts, uh, so you don't have to worry about the actual Docker command. You know, we, we have something called the PowerTrain file, which you can tell like how many instances you want to run, what ports you have, and things like that, on the non variables and stuff like that. So it is our like mini orchestration tool that we just talked about. Right? It's providing a declarative way to describe what your application needs are, like how many instances you want to run. That is, it's very, very good. Right? So, so when Docker 112 came out, we also modify a power train to one with Swarm as well. So with, with, uh, with Swarm, what you can do is you can submit a Docker service task, 
right? Which, we can, which is then going to start your application as a service on the swarm host, right? So I should be able to simply do this, our train service swarm. So what this is going to do is it's going to read this power train MK file that you just looked at, and then it's going to see and it will run this image, right? And I need to spin up I don't know the instances that were like the two instances that I need onto my swamp plus or That's why I need to. So see if it does that. It's pretty fast, right? So let's see what we did. So if you see this, it's running this service command. Okay? It's did Docker service create. It exports the port that we just specified in the PowerTrain MK file. Update delay is something which is like, if you want to update this application and you feel like 10 containers running, it's going to wait five seconds before it brings down the containers, right? So you get a rolling update per container. Update parallelism is something similar. It's going to only update one container at a time. If you give it like two, it's going to update two containers at a time. How long does it take to Replica is like, I want to run two containers of this application. And I want to name this service, Tactilia Demo, and this is my image at positive.cost.com, tailgate demo on the So now, now, keep in mind, I'm talking to the demon on AWS, right? But I'm still on the right I can do service less. So there's <coughs> a lot of things running there. So the service we just submitted to the Docker Swarm cluster, right? It's supposed to start to do instances, but it didn't start it anyway. So let's see what went on. Because the demo goes on our So now I can list every process that this service has. In this case, there should be two, right? And I can give the name of this. So it was submitted, but it's taking some time to fail. Right. So you see, like, this is the actual That's the current state. It's actually running. One of the instances is running. And what are we still about to run? Now, if you go back to our cluster, when I did that Terraform show, what it did was it gave me the IP addresses of all my clusters, right? So now the services are running out there somewhere. Right, on, on any of this host, I don't know which one. Right? But the good part about Docker Swarm is like, I I told Swarm to start running this service on port 9111. Right? I don't know where, where this container is running. But I should be able to pick any of this IP address and hit 9111 and I should be able to route it to that service. So let's try to do that. something on the cloud from my laptop, running just by a single command. Right. So now look at our service, right? It's running two replicas. So now let's say we did some performance testing on this one, and uh, the results are not good. We need to run more containers on this. What do we do? What do we do traditionally, right? We provision more servers. We provision more VMs. Right, it's a big process. It's like it might take a week or months to provision the service, right? But now I can simply do this. So it's here. Take the demo. It's 10. Now I can do this. We started to do the It's as simple as that. So now what you can do is you can listen to some monitoring on AWS, think like, oh shit, this, this service is not doing the uh, TPS I'm supposed to maintain. You can listen to the events and then like, oh, okay, fine, I can just run Docker service scale. You can scale the application as simple as that. 
and you can also so this is just creating containers within those six uh, Docker Swarm posts that we have. Right? Ideally, a real orchestration tool should think, okay, fine, all these six containers are not enough now. They don't have enough resources. So all these six servers, they don't have enough resources. I might need one more post in my entire cluster. So that tool should create one more post. Right? So you're provisioning servers on demand. Right? It's, it's a lot of cost savings and more than that. Lots of cost, energy savings, everything. A lot of benefits of that. Right? But yes, you can do that. But we should also check what if I want to like, not run the containers again. I can run the same command and just say one. And then we should bring it down to just one container. It's going to shut down for like this. It's going to shut down all those instances. So it's very, very efficient. It's very efficient the way you run your applications and containerize them. So that was the talk. And uh, I just want to improve how easy it is to use containers. Right? If you containerize your application, you can just run it anywhere, whatever it is. When you shut it down, is it just randomly choose which ones to shut down? Yeah. So the, the orchestration built in in Swarm is pretty advanced as well. So it also looks into the resources in Google as well and onto those posts. When you say, I want to run, let's say, on red container, you can do it. That's right. To submit the steps. I don't know what instance type I'll go with. I think they're too large, so they're not going to take this, but it's going to start and do that. Right? Uh, so now, when you do this, it's smart enough to see which host has what resources available. And keep in mind, like we are still running that LXC container, right? It's still running in the namespace and those sequence. So now, technically, in this Powertrain MK file, You can actually provide, like you know, how much CPU you want for this application, how much post CPU you need, how much memory you want to give to this container, right? And that Swarm engine won't allow it to use more than that CPU you need. Right now, it is not configured or anything, so it's going to use one of the default things, which is like in its two gigs or a little bit on the post. But you can restrict every container, just like how we saw how we can restrict the processes in that namespace and C groups. You can restrict just by putting something in this file, I just want this one CPU and this one memory. How about I, is there, can you limit I use as well by container? Or? No. Not really. provision more containers for applications so that the load on that container can go down. And you can also provision a whole new host into your orchestration. I, I think your specific, about 70% is what we've traditionally used as a cap before we start looking at new. Uh, okay. I didn't know if it was 50 or 20. 70% 70, 70 utilization. So you're giving the number. Is there any way you can order scale based on the traffic? So that's what I talked about. Docker Swarm does not does, does not do that automatically. The, uh, the orchestration tools out there they do that, like Kubernetes or like other tools like ECS, and they all do that. Like you can tell it, but that's a tool. Either you can download that tool, or you can configure one of those orchestration tools to do that. You can give it a TPS. You can tell it my this service based on the health checks that you can define. This service should only should maintain a TPS of so and so requests per second. If it says it's not performing that, then it should be smart enough to spin up more containers or more hosts. It needs to. So when you scale down the instances, does it go and clean up the Yes, it does. Cool. Yeah, it's going to stop those containers immediately, right? So, but those images can still stay there. The containers will be down, so those processes will be killed. But that application image is still there. But keep in mind, it's an application image is shared across all those containers. If your application image is 100 megabytes 
And if you run like uh, 100 containers, it's not going to run like a, it's not going to provision that space for every container. Right? It's still going to use a 100 megabyte base image. And when it starts a container, it's going to create a file system layer on top of that same image. Right? So it's a very thin layer. So it's not that you are creating copies of the image. You're still running the same image base image. So, so when you kill, when you scale down, those processes will go away, but the image will still be there. Because that's how it's very fast. Next time you run the same command, it can spin up that image right away. So the other thing I'm going to point out is all of this, like, you know, before, like, developers, everything was very black box, right? Uh, they don't know how to run, like, what should be my optimal CPU, memory, all those things, even environment variables for that. But using something like this, developers can control everything that they need in their application. Right? They, they can do their own performance tests anywhere they prefer, and then they can tell, in this file, I need this much resources from the application to run. Right? And they have, the, they have all the control. How many containers do we have running at any one time right now? How many containers? Uh, so, let me see that. 30. Uh, so as a part host, we have about like at least 10 containers running, so about 40, 45 containers running. It's very, very minimal. We're not there yet. And we are still running, we're not running Docker Swarm in production yet. Uh, we're just running all those individual Docker hosts and we're using Jenkins to like you know, deploy those hosts to push them. What is running these containers that like load is, right? And so the rendering is, there are a couple of services running SIYs in containers. There's new uh, stuff like document generators and containers. There are new uh, NBC services which are running as containers. So we have a web tier and a service tier. So it's 45 containers. When was the first one deployed? When was the first one deployed? I remember. Uh, the first one was the rendering one, which was this year in the uh, beginning of this year when we moved to Node.js. So it was February. So, uh, since you brought that up, it was very easy for us when we moved all our renderings of the Node.js, we bundled that into a Docker container. So it was very easy for us to just deploy it. Otherwise, we had to come up with a whole new environment and have all the Node.js dependencies installed on all those cluster of servers, and we had no idea how we were going to manage that. Docker just made that very, very easy for us. I also understand there's a movement right now to actually move some containers to the cloud for real? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I know Sandeep was working on uh, the you know, the all market service POC, and uh, the, there's a cloud, there's a cloud uh, working group which is working on the, I think it's, it's careers page, so like they're trying to run those containers on the cloud. But they're also looking into a lot of latency issues between the cloud and the data center. But uh, we're also building a platform, and you know, Kyle and I have been working on building this platform to create provision swarm on uh, AWS. And then we can start modify some of the software right from the right new software to deploy this application on the cloud into this one. And that includes config management and things like that. So we'll hear more about all that things. What's our orchestration tool? Or what are we leaning towards? What are we going to lean towards? As of right now, we're going to use Docker Swarm. We're going to we're going to test it out in production uh, next year, first quarter next year sometime, and uh, see what are the what are our use cases? So, and that's the approach we've taken with Docker in general. We tried some new things. We didn't like go with any tool which is available out there. We just finally used it. We want to test everything out. We did run a lot of POCs. We did uh, look at Apache Mesos. I know Mac and Jeremy worked on that too. We did Docker Swarm before 1.12. Uh, we also looked into Kubernetes a little bit. But as of right now, we are leading towards Docker Swarm to provide some of the orchestration features. All the scaling of like auto scaling and policy management and things like that. We'll still look into some like, some of the AWS is built in feature, you know, like cloud watching and other monitor stuff. But like you mentioned, it's not a complete orchestration. It's not a complete tool, but it is doing what we need our current use cases to do.